This evening, we are going to be having a presentation on our K through six opportunity program. And um, our director of elementary education, Leo Schluter, will be presenting this evening with his team. Thank you, Leo. Not really, the, um, I'm not sure the microphone is okay. doing well. I'm working on it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Narducci. Thank you for providing us the opportunity to share with you tonight some information about our elementary opportunity program. I have some key individuals with me tonight who are going to help me present, so let me take a moment to introduce them to you now. We have Kristen Driscoll. She's one of our elementary specialists who helps support our schools and our opportunity program here at the district. We have Ms. Megan Davis. She's our Assistant Director of Student Services. And then we're proud to have our two principals, both of whom uh, host one of our opportunity programs at their site. We have Dr. Corey Brenner, who is the principal at Shumway Leadership Academy, and Dr. Shannon Hannon, who is the principal at Fulton Elementary. You'll hear briefly from them tonight as well. Oh, wrong button. So as I said, you'll hear tonight a little bit about the history and the operations of our opportunity program. But first, we wanted to share with you the four overarching goals of the program as it seeks to meet the needs of students who are assigned to that program. And rather than read it all to you, as you look through those goals, I really want you to find that that common theme as you read through all of them is a focus of a, behavior, of a structured behavior management program that runs throughout our opportunity assignment. This program seeks, through the four goals up there, to address the persistent behavioral challenges that both impede the learning and interrupt the classroom experience in our K-6 classrooms. And it does so using a structured, predictable intervention plan while also delivering the instructional needs in a much smaller group setting. And what you might be thinking is, well, Mr. Schlater, don't we, ha don't we want those things for all our classrooms? Absolutely. However, we do know that we also have some select students who come to us with increasingly challenging behavior as a result of many factors. And what we've seen is that for most of these students, if we give them a small environment where behavior can be zeroed in to identify those triggers and build positive outcomes, with the appropriate behavioral tools and the strategies employed, we can shape this behavior over time so that they can indeed be successful back in their general education classroom. It's also important to note that Chandler Unified has been ahead of the curve in some terms with our alternative behavior program for its elementary general education students, particularly given the recent legislation, HB 2123, which governs the issuance of out-of-school suspensions for students in grades K-4. As you may recall when we brought that to the board, one of the components of this legislation requires that site administration, in concert with district administration, look at potential alternative programs or alternative to suspension or alternative behavioral intervention models that may be feasible prior to continuing to suspend a student outside of school. Our opportunity program provides just that kind of alternative to suspension if and when it becomes necessary. Additionally, as you will hear, in the next, about, as you will hear next about the components and operational features of this program, it's really important that you hone in on, on um, goal four, because truly what I want to underscore is our opportunity program is an assignment. It is not designed to be a placement. It's not designed to be a residing hole for students to stay for their K-6 career. It's designed to be an opportunity, uh, a small segment of time where we can provide some, some targeted behavioral interventions so that we can get them back into the general education classroom or we can get them additional services that they, that they may qualify for. So next, I'm going to bring up Kristen Driscoll. She's our elementary specialist, and she's going to share some additional information about the history and program information. Thank you, Mr. Schluter, and good evening, Madam President, board members, and Superintendent Narducci. All right. Um, the Opportunity Program started over 20 years ago and was originally named the TLC Program. The main purpose of the TLC program was to develop an alternative setting for students who were suspended from school. Around this time, we had 19 schools in CUSD with an increase of schools in our southeast quadrant. 
Approximately 10 years ago, the name changed from TLC to Opportunity, and we broke the program up into two grade level bands, K2 and three through six, with an 18 month assignment maximum. The district also saw a need to redesign the program, so we hired a district behavior support to help with this implementation. We made modifications to increase intervention implementation, and we hired a paraprofessional to assist in both classrooms. Around six years ago, the district implemented the engineered classroom program with three main components. <clears throat> Students would have a point system to measure their success, Students would also have counseling support through Southwest Behavioral Health. And finally, students would have opportunities to mainstream into the classroom to practice what they had been learning in opportunity. And that is still our current uh, practice. All right, moving on to program roles. Uh, we have the referring site roles and the opportunity site roles. So when a, I'll start with referring site. When a site uh, sees an increase in behaviors with a student, there are a few pieces they need to have in place before making a referral for opportunity to the Office of Elementary Education. First, there should be ongoing communication between the team of educators at the site, the administration, and the parent who work with the student. The tool that we use to assist with this is called a positive behavior support plan. The plan details the role and responsibility of each party and a timeline for review. The student should also be in the MTSS or the multi-tiered leveled support system at their school and be, and be receiving behavior interventions. At this time, the referring site can engage with district support, which would be a consult with one of our behavior specialists. The opportunity site also has roles. They would schedule an intake meeting with the referring site, opportunity site, parent, and a member from our Southwest Behavioral Health team. During this meeting, the team would discuss current needs of the student, set future goals, and a start date. The opportunity site would be delivering all instruction within the engineered uh, classroom. And the opportunity site also stays in constant communication with the referring site to keep them up to date with student progress and also assist with uh, also assist with referring site if there is a need for an evaluation. Finally, the opportunity site assists with transitioning the student back to their home school. Most importantly, if a student is placed in opportunity, they still stay connected to their home school. For example, if Hancock refers a student to opportunity at Fulton, then the student still stays a Hancock student. The Hancock team would follow up with visitations every five to six weeks while the student is in opportunity. There are five main requirements um, in opportunity. First, the student must be in grades K through six in the general ed education setting. Number two, all documents must be in place before a referral can be placed into the Office of Elementary Education for consideration, and that would be that positive behavior support plan I mentioned. Student uh, must be in the MTSS um, referral process and receiving interventions. Uh, we need to see documentation of those interventions and also um, support from one of our behavior specialists. Number three, um, the student will receive door-to-door -door transportation. And the student and their family are required to have counseling services through Southwest Behavioral Health. The Southwest team will determine if this is in person or virtual. And finally, the opportunity assignment will not exceed 18 months. At this point, if a student is still in, um, we will have discussions if evaluation needs to take place or reviewed for further supports. Thank you. And I will call up Megan Davis next. Good evening. Our opportunity classroom has some classroom features that include um, positive behavior supports. Everything we do is evidence-based. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with a token economy type of a system. We have levels with incentives and there's contingent and non-contingent reinforcement. So we're teaching those classroom expectations. 
reinforcing them, and we're also giving the students a lot of praise, behavior-specific praise. We have a lot of emphasis on social-emotional learning and making sure that students learn how to be students functioning in the classroom in the different settings around campus. As they begin to phase out into the more typical setting, we provide lots of supports and we keep track of what supports are working best for the students so that when they do transition back to the home school, which is always our goal, that we have a solid behavior support plan in place to make sure that they are set up for success with their behavior. We also um, provide differentiated instruction because these are multi-grade level classrooms. So we are making sure that students get exposed to that tier one general education curriculum so that they are ready to transition back and um, and be on level with their peers. And I believe that is uh, the gist of those program years. So now we'll pass it back to Mr. Slater. Thank you, Megan. As, as we wanted to show you a little breakdown tonight of oh, let me get to my sheet, sir. The, um, the participation um, in our opportunity program, kind of a longitudinal breakdown. I went as far back as 18 and 19, okay? It's been in place for a while longer. Um, I came up here in my director role as nine, in 1920 and, and kind of um, took over the oversight of opportunities. So I t I'm, I'm gonna take you one year back. And as you see on that chart, you're gonna find um, the three rows below. Basically, you're gonna get a breakdown of the total number of students who were assigned in that school year to the opportunity program. Remember, there are K-6 students that would be assigned out of, um, out of one of our regular K-6 sites. The number of new students who were assigned that year, as well as the number of students who were exited. It's important when we talk about exiting the program that it's not just students who are going back to their home school. Generally speaking, it may be students who withdraw from the district. It may be students who do indeed through, a, through um, the duration of some, at some point during that 18 month period, will we'll, um, we'll have phased into the, uh, to a piece where we can get them back to the home school um, and be successful in their general education setting with whatever supports they need. And then there are, there are select students as well who may, during that process, may qualify for additional special education services, whether that be back at their home school um, or whether it be at one of the regionalized specialized programs. Okay, um, a couple things to note. Um, I think as you look across the top, you see that we've, that, that top row, you've seen that we've, we've changed the program periodically in terms of locations. In 18 and 19, we had three programs. However, they were housed in two sites at Galveston and Navarette. We then opened up, and that was a, a, a K-1, a 2-3, I believe, and a 4-6. We then opened up two K-1 programs, one at Riggs and one at Fulton. We had a two three at Navar we had a two three at Navarette and a four through I'm sorry we had a two three at Shumway and a four through six at Navarette, um, and then you'll see that we carried that through into the 2021 school year. But as a part of um, in concert with some of the budget cuts that we took a look at at the end of the 2021 school year and looking at the the amount of staffing we had with four programs versus the number of referrals that were coming through we really felt that we could move down to two programs. So this year, in 21-22, we have a K-2 program at Fulton Elementary, and we have a 3-6 program at Navarette. We, so we, we've increased the grade level band a little. However, we've also, um, we've also allocated an additional paraeducator to each of those programs. So each program has a certified opportunity teacher and three paraeducators that help support the students that are in that program. You know, I think it's also important to note that when you go from, when you look across that top, well, the third row, I guess it would be, in 20 to 21 to 21, 22, we have seen a little bit of an uptick in the amount of students that have been, um, that have been um, referred and that are currently participating in the program. As to be expected a little bit as we come out of COVID, we saw the, you know, the erratic routines and the, and the schedules, it, it played a little impact. I, I don't think, let's be honest, it played a little impact and we've seen a little bit of an uptick. However, I, I want to point out that when we're talking about a, a K-6 program with um, 30 ele 31 elementary schools, 19,000 plus students, currently we're servicing 13 kids in our elementary opportunity program out of all those students. A 
Now, I'm going to bring up um, both of our principals. They're going to just share a brief little insight, um, um, tell you a little bit about the pro their program on their site, and a brief little insight into their experience with Opportunity, both Dr. Brenner and Dr. Hannon. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and Superintendent Narducci. Thank you for allowing me to be here this evening to share some information about our Opportunity Program at Fulton. We do have, I have six of those 13 kids at Fulton. Um, and one thing I think that was um, maybe not mentioned that is very important to the programming is a relationship that we build with the kids and the families as they transition to a new school. I think that's one of the um, most difficult pieces for families is that switch in schools. And so we pride ourselves on ensuring that we have all of our staff involved, our K through two teachers, they make it a point to be a part of that opportunity program. So as students start to transition into their classrooms, they are familiar, they know their teachers, they know the hallway that they're gonna be in. And it's me also working with parents to welcome them to Fulton and to be a part of our school. Um, we've had situations where kids have been successful and they have opened, enrolled, and stayed at our school. So we want to try to support our students as much as possible. And we understand the relationship um, is probably one of the most important pieces that we establish with families. The other piece that is very important to us, when we get a behavior student, we understand that we have to focus in and work on that behavior, but it's also important that if we send a student back to their home school, that academic piece really has to be there. I was able to be a part of the opportunity program about 10 years ago prior to the engineer classroom, and the difference from that programming to what is offered today is night and day. And so the opportunity for students to actually be successful and make progress has been um, very enlightening to see. I wanna thank the team and the district for allowing us to have this opportunity for students, but this, the team that we have also was always open to communication about how we can improve the program. Um, and I just appreciate and um, I love having the program on my campus and um, I feel that if we can continue to have the relationship that we can build with families and that we can get kids back into their home schools, that we will continue to have progress in our programs and we will see kids that are able to come, get what they need, and get back on with their K-12 education. So thank you. Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Artucci, I reiterate everything that Dr. Hannon just said. Um, the, a piece I think I can add to that is, and I wanna underscore that relationship building that starts with that first transition meeting and setting goals with parents. Um, as our kids start to phase out, a big component we really work on is as we identify why, what is triggering each behavior to make sure that that positive BSP is in place, but also realistic and manageable for a general education teacher to be implementing in the classroom since ultimately our goal is for them to be back in a larger setting. Um, I would say an added benefit to our campus as a whole is that through collaboration with district support and as our teams is we've been able to build greater capacity through that team with other members of our staff as well. So the expertise doesn't only lie with them but because they're able to share and teach and collaborate with the students and the teachers as they're phasing in and out, we've been able to build some capacity with additional staff members as well. Um, of our kids, <clears throat> clearly the other ones are mine, um, we actually in the last two years have graduated, we call it graduated out, and we celebrate them, and um, it's recognized, and we make a big deal out of it. And of those who've graduated in the last couple of years, two of those, I think, believe we've had four graduate, three or four graduate, um, two have chosen to stay on open enrollment. And I think part of that is because they feel safe and secure. Um, even though they're back in that general education setting full time, they still know they have a team there to support them if they, they need that pep talk or they just need the break or they need to debrief on something. Um, key, the other key, really key component is certainly that Southwest Behavioral Health component and that those services are delivered on our campus for that student for the most part um, and then they get family support beyond that. And so there's a nice communication and collaboration there too where that, um, Therapist isn't going to disclose things necessarily to our team, but they can help enlighten us as far as there are trigger, other triggers identified for that behavior, or I've learned that this is something that's bothering them, we can help them here at school this way. So um, again, it's certainly a collaborative team approach. It's not a, a one, one person making it happen, but between both the site and district support.
Thank you, Dr. Brenner and uh, Dr. Hannon. I just I want to underscore too how incredibly um, dedicated and if you walk into, I would invite you to both sites to go to go look at either opportunity program. To, but to see the relationships that the teachers, the staff build with students, and like Dr. Brenner said, oftentimes when students graduate, they don't want to leave the school. They certainly want to owe to the school because they have those peer-to-peer -peer relationships that they've built through the mainstreaming and the peer-to-teacher relationships. You can see there's a culture at those schools that say, we're, we're going to embrace these students and the challenges they bring with it. Um, and we're willing to work both in tandem with the behavior specialist, with the opportunity teacher, to make sure, to ensure that these kids are, su are successful. So that if they want to go back to their home school, they can, or they're certainly welcome to stay at the school in a general education setting on, let's say, an open enrollment, so that they can continue those positive peer-to-peer -peer roles. Lastly, before we open it up to questions, we're always kind of looking at where do we need to go next, or what, what, what do we need to do to refine, OK? Um, and clearly, these three stand out. Um, first of all, we, we continue to have conversations with both um, Megan Davis, the behavior specialist, Southwest, the teachers, as well as the principals of that program to say, where do we have to be equally more proactive in our approaches to behavior management out in the K-6 sites um, so, that, um, so that we can stem the need for opportunity? And, and I would go back to the previous slide where when I say, you know, we have 13 students that we're servicing currently out of 19,000. I do think that speaks volumes to the amount of support and the great things that each one of our 31 sites are doing proactively in their K-6 setting to manage behavior, to develop positive peer-to-peer -peer relationships, to be proactive in their roles before, before it gets to an opportunity um, assignment. Again, we're, all, we're also looking at continued training and professional development. It's not, we recognize it's not enough just to take a positive behavioral support plan, hand it to a teacher and say, okay, make this work. We've got to actually empower them and arm them with the behavioral tools and the strategies that are going to work for students. They have to know them so that they can teach them to their students. Um, so we continue to look for ways that we can deliver training and professional development in behavioral management um, strategies both in our opportunity programs as well as all K-6 general education setting classrooms. And then, of course, as always, we will always continue to go back and look and see where our needs, where our needs for opportunity programs. Do, can we downsize? Do we need to add additional programs? Right now, we, we, I think we're split, you heard we're split about six and seven. We manage those fairly well. Um, but obviously, if we see, continue to see large upticks, we may have to come back and see, do we have to open up an additional program or not? Okay. Or, again, I would go back to that first one and say they are in tandem. The more we can do proactively with behavior management at our sites, the less opportunity we're going to need for opportunity. Okay. And that ends our portion. Questions that you may have for me or the team? I want to thank you um, for you and the team um, for presenting this to us. Um, are there any questions from the board? Ms. Love. So what if a family is connected to services outside of Southwest Behavioral Health? Do we make allowances for that service provider to come on campus, or do they have to switch? Th that's a great question, Ms. Love. I will tell you, we do make allowances. Generally, this, what we find is a service provider won't come on campus, but generally that's a, that's a counseling provider that that student is going to outside, like a private counseling provider. Mm -hmm. We will take that. Typically what we ask for is some kind of documentation mm -hmm. that there's been some regular attendance or they're seeing that provider. So we don't, while we don't mandate Southwest Behavioral, we do require counseling at the family and the individual level. You can certainly seek that. If We don't, we don't want to circumvent a relationship that they already have with a counselor. So if they're doing that, if they have that in place, certainly that's more than happy to continue. And then like the next question that I have is what happens when they do transition or if they do transition back to their home school? You're using a token economy in this setting. Does that go with them? Um, and then if it does, like how does that play out with the other students? Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually have uh, Mrs. Davis speak to that a little bit because they're a little more involved in that transition process. OK. Good evening again. Thank you for your question. We do 
take a lot of data to determine what's most effective for each individual student. And then once they transition back to their home school, they have a behavior support plan with them. So if that looks like a student contract where we're um, taking some data as to whether or not they're reaching certain goals for the day. Um, sometimes it's what we call a bonus card, which is our non-contingent reinforcement, where we're just giving praise paired with that artifact so that they can earn some prizes or we'll keep a check-in, check-out in place, maybe with the school counselor or with another adult on campus that they have a good relationship with. So it really is individualized to the student as far as what supports we keep in place when they go back. But um, we typically, they are kind of weaned off some of those supports by the time they make that transition because they gradually transition um, on the opportunity sites. And there's a lot of communication between the opportunity teacher and the other teachers on campus who are hosting those students in their classrooms and inviting them to be part of their learning communities. Thank you. Are there any other questions from? Um, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Olive. Uh, quick question, Lil, do you, have you guys kept any uh, data about the folks that have, or the kids that have transitioned out of the program, uh, what their high school graduation rates are, or anything like that? Oh, you know what, I don't, I don't have that data with me. I can certainly look. I can't tell you that we've been intentional about tracking at, to that level. I think that's a good, I think that's a good suggestion. We certainly, I'll, I'll see what I can gather it would probably largely be students prior to 1819 at this stage. I'll look and see what I can gather. Um, I can tell you that of all of our students that do, that do transition out of the site, typically we tend to see a larger increase of students who, who um, whether they transition back to their, their home school or they transition with additional to a regional specialized program, we tend to see a, a larger group of students who qualify for special education services, and therefore they transition out at that point because they can be successful with resource support at their home school or in a regional setting. Okay, but I haven't. I can't tell you that I've tracked um, the exact uh, kindergarten. Oh, no, the exact not kindergarten. We don't move them backwards. Um, the exact um, graduation rates, but a good thing to do. We can certainly go back and look and see what we can gather. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Mrs. Bruner, do you have any questions? Um, Mr. Worth, do you have any questions? Oh, I'm still thinking. You go first, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I'm good. <laughs> I, I guess, you know, I, I now understand when people go through the finance how they get lost. Well, I get, I get a little bit lost in, in this stuff. Um, can, can you just do a, a quick summary of why this program is better than what we've done? Real okay. quick summary. Sure. Two, three, Mr. Worth, well, because I think here, here it is. In the absence, um, for our students who, who have severe behavioral challenges that are, in, that are general education, that are impeding the classroom learning, in the absence of, of no structured program to put in place, um, particularly when you're operating in a classroom of 25 or 26, like I said at the beginning, this provides a small group environment with targeted interventional intervention supports along with counseling with the goal of getting them back to a classroom, to a general education classroom. Um, and prior to, prior to TLC is what I would tell you is we didn't have that at all. So those students, they floundered in the classroom or the result was we're just gonna continue to suspend you and hope that that perhaps changes behavior. We know that suspension in and of itself doesn't change behavior generally speaking, okay? Um, so this program provides that targeted support. Mr. Leader, if I can add to that, sure. Mr. Worth, um, the alternative to a program like this would be suspension, and we just don't feel that when students need to be uh, developed behaviorally, um, not everybody comes to us with the same skills, that this provides us an opportunity to keep our students on in school, learning, and to work with the behaviors. It is a transitional program, however, because we don't think it's the end all. As Mr. Sleater said, many times we find that there may be services needed. That gives us time to observe. I think the other thing, too, that's successful in a short summary is that they're in schools, and I know Dr. Hannon and Dr. Dr. Brenner talked about it, but they're in very caring environment, schools that accept them unconditionally, but provide services where they're at. And um, that, that's an extra step up to allow our kids then to be able to open enroll to those schools because they've created another 
great climate that they feel uh, they're valued and they work towards in their new successful environment. And that's an option that we provide. Many students do go back to their home schools and transition back. Uh, but the whole idea is transitional until success. And uh, we stay with that until we see the behavioral success um, so that they can um, transition into a, a regular environment. But I think the biggest, the biggest success I see with the program is that we don't have off-campus placements for very long. Are there any other questions? Mr. Worth, are you done? I am done, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, um, thank you again for um, uh, doing a study session on the Opportunity Program. Um, I can see that how this can truly uh, benefit our, our students, especially those, and our staff, because um, having a um, chronically disruptive student within your classroom um, really is stressful for, for a teacher. And to be able to have another support system for uh, students like that um, is, is a great help um, and is a great um, alternative to suspension. Um, and it does truly focus on the child, um, making sure that that child gets the education that he or she needs, um, along with um, teaching them how to actually behave in a classroom. So thank you so much. And thank you to all of our staff um, who are working in these programs. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, members of the board. And we will, at this point, take about a 10-minute break. <laughs> <laughs>